Welcome to the first video for the second review module for algebra. The second part of the algebra review module focuses more on manipulations, particularly manipulations of variables. So getting into a little bit more of what we need to do things like calculus, where we have to move a lot of variables around and be pretty proficient with those manipulations. So I want to make sure that we're comfortable with all those very different ways in which we move things around. One of the most important one of those is factoring. To understand factoring, let's go back to the case of numbers. Before we talked about the distributive law, and that was where we had multiplication distributes over addition. Factoring essentially is doing the opposite. It's having something that is expressed as an addition and pulling it out so it looks like a distributive law, so returning it to something that looks like this form. And we do that by finding a common factor. In this case, the common factor is 3. 12 is 3 times 4. 15 is 3 times 5. And also, the other side of this equation, 3 is also a factor of 27. But I'll deal with the left side for now. So this looks a lot like this right side after distribution. So I can go backwards. I can undo the distribution and pull the 3 out here, this common factor, because it would distribute over the 4 and the 5 and give me back what I started with. So factoring is pulling out those common factors and writing them before the application of the distribution law. And then you can do something with them. In this case, I could divide both sides of the equation by 3, and then the threes will cancel here, 27 over 3 will give me 9, and I can write my equation in a simpler form. And that's often the case with factoring, is we're pulling out factors to try and get rid of them or try and remove them, try and cancel them off, to try and write things in a more reasonable form. So that's what it looks like with numbers, essentially trying to undo the distributive law, going back to a form that happens before we do the distribution. It looks the same with variables. So let's get into an example where we can do this with variables. So on the right side here, my variable x shows up in each of these terms. So I can undo the distributive law because x is essentially a factor of this term and a factor of this term. I can write that x out front here because if I distributed, that the first term would turn back into my x squared, the second term would turn back into my negative 5x. The distribution would give me back what I originally started with. So this is factoring is with a variable, pulling a variable out that happens to be a common factor. And then again, I can do the manipulations I have. I can divide both sides of the equation by x. That will cancel this x off. That will cancel this x off and leave me with x minus 5 equals 9. And that's something that's a lot easier to solve than my original complicated equation. I can solve that to give me x equals 14. Now, because I divided by x in this step, I have to be aware of the possibility of x equals 0, because the division only makes sense if x is not equal to 0. Anytime, anytime you divide by something, anytime you cancel something off, you have to be aware. And I can go back and check. If I put x equals 0 in my original equation, I would get 0 squared minus 5 times 0. On the right, on the left, rather, that would be 0. On the right, I would get 9 times 0. That would be 0. Those are, in fact, equal. So x equals 0 is also a solution. This has two solutions, and I get the second solution by remembering whenever I pull something out and divide by it, I have to check that it might have been 0. This is very, very frequent when we're dealing with factoring. We're often pulling things out and checking them, canceling them off. So this is, this is good practice when you're factoring things off to be aware of the possibility that the thing you factored off might have been 0. Here's another example. This example involves simplifying a complicated fraction. Here the variable is p. p is a common factor of both of those terms. p is also a common factor of both of those terms. So I can factor the numerator and factor the denominator. So if I pull the factor p out here, p times p squared, when I multiply bases, I add exponents, so that'll give me p cubed. p times 4 will give me 4p, so that will recover the denominator, or the numerator rather, and the denominator p times p is p squared, p times negative 7 is negative 7p, so that will re recover the original denominator. And then I can cancel those off. And this, this is an important thing to know about fractions, is I can only cancel things off which are factors of the whole fraction. 
I can't cancel anything off in this original form because nothing is a common factor of the entire numerator or the entire denominator. I can only cancel off things that are factors of the entire numerator or the entire denominator. And that's one of the most important reasons why we have to do factoring for dealing with complicated expressions in fractions like these. Then I get this expression, um, and I have to remember there shouldn't be an equal sign here. I have to remember, since I cancel things off, that uh, I have a restriction here that p cannot equal 0. Because at this step, the canceling is essentially dividing by p, and I'm not allowed to divide by 0. So I'm just sort of keeping myself a note that if there's any situations in the future where my variable p might be 0, I can't rely on these steps, this cancellation step because that would have led to division by zero. Now let me finish with a more complicated kind of factoring. And th this is the start of a whole huge piece of mathematics of trying to find more complicated factors. And there's lots of different ways to do this. I, I want to show this not as a thing that I necessarily expect you to be able to do, but more as an example of where this goes. So I have a, an expression in the variable x here. And it happens that x is a common factor um, of the first two terms. It's a common factor of the first three terms, but I'm going to only notice for now that it's a common factor of the first two terms. And I'm going to factor it out of the first two terms. So I factor an x out of here, I'm left with a 4x. I factor an x out of here, I'm left with a negative 2. And then the interesting thing that happens is that this and this, if I just group this together with a bracket, and multiplied by 1, multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything, are the same thing. So I can also think of this as a distribution of this whole thing times x, which is here, plus this whole thing times 1, which is here. So I can also distribute binomials, larger terms. So in this way, by sort of carefully grouping these first two together, and these second two together, I actually get a factorization here. And this gets even more clever and more subtle because the expression might have shown up like this originally. And in this, it's not necessarily obvious what this factoring is. However, if I subtract 2x and add 2x and just sort of stick that in the middle there, Subtracting and adding the same thing doesn't change anything. I'm allowed to subtract and add the same thing. Plus 7 minus 7 doesn't change anything. The same is true for minus 2x plus 2x. But then if I group these two together, I get a 4 here, and this negative 2 stays as negative 2, and I get the original expression that I had before, and I could factor it as I did before and get this factorization. So I get this factorization of this 4x squared plus 2x minus 2, in this relatively tricky and clever way. And this is part of the whole branch of mathematics, which is factoring quadratics, which I'll talk about in the review module on polynomials and quadratics. For now, take it as an example of one of the complicated ways in which factoring can happen, just to show you that factoring gets more and more involved as we go on into deeper and deeper mathematics.